We bypassed the problem we had earlier with a 1350 megahertz lock on one of our Titan RTX cards, and now we can properly test them in SLI. So these are the same device, they're both working this time, and they come out to about $5,000 total between the two of them. We've done this test before with RTX 2080 Ti's, and these really aren't all that different. We have a review of the Titan RTX on the channel. If you want to see the performance differences between one of them and one of the 2080 Ti's, you can check that review. But today, we're really just seeing how far does it go when you put them in SLI, which is what NVLink is. And we're going to look at primarily games with some additional focus on power consumption, just because just it's fun to see how much power a system can draw under a sort of maximum high-end GPU configuration available at present. Before that, this video is brought to you by us and the Gamers Nexus store. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our ceramic mugs, critically acclaimed mod mats, or educational video card teardown and PCB anatomy posters that teach the names and placements of all the key PCB components. Learn more at store.gamersnexus.net or click the link below. Just as a reminder, these are really devices that you're going to use for things like production tasks, which is not what we are testing. We're testing first with gaming, and our previous test was with overclocking, power, acoustics, noise, and thermals. And the point is really, I mean, that's just, it's what we want to do. It's a bit more fun, and we're going to put them in a, a higher-end overclocking setup at some point in the near future. But we do hope to eventually look at these from a production standpoint. It's just we're waiting on some of the software that we would use for production testing to update so we can leverage RTX and the RT cores properly, or the Tensor cores, as it may be. So that's something we're waiting on. The reason these are better for production than just straight gaming is because, ultimately, it's the same GPU. It's still TU-102, it's just there are four more SMs enabled on the Titan than on the 2080 Ti. And then secondarily, the only real difference beyond that, which that was an insignificant one, is that it's got a little more than two times more memory. So it's 24 gigabytes instead of 11, and that is a significant change, and one which will impact things like, for example, Blender, where Blender, if you're rendering on the GPU, you might run out of GPU memory with some specific project files. But we're not testing any of that. We're testing gaming. So now that you know those differences and where these should be applied, we can look at where they shouldn't be applied, which is in a gaming computer with $5,000 worth of gilded video cards inside of them. Sniper Elite 4 comes up first, running at 4K high with DirectX 12 and async compute. As always, we select our game benchmarks based on what they illustrate, carefully choosing each one. Sniper is the best representation of a well-optimized DX12 title with asynchronous compute. With this configuration, SLI Titan RTX cards end up at 219 FPS average, just ahead of the RTX 2080 Ti's and SLI, which run at 210 FPS average. Lows are well-timed on each device, but we'll look at frame times momentarily to see better what's happening underneath the hood. The 1080 Ti's and SLI end up at 170 FPS average, also a strong performance in frame times. Overall, we see scaling of about 96% over a single Titan RTX card's 112 FPS average. The RTX 2080 Ti's posted roughly 94% scaling over a single RTX 2080 Ti, so the Titan is consistent with our previous scaling findings. A well-built game will clearly give plenty of room for scaling, although it still doesn't make any financial sense to go with two Titan RTX cards over two RTX 2080 Ti cards, and even that's questionable. Frame times should be more interesting to look at. As always, this gives you a look at frame-to-frame -frame experience and illustrates any potential spikes or stutters that would otherwise be averaged out. We care about lower frame times, but more importantly, about consistent frame times with minimum deviation from the mean. More than an 8 to 12 millisecond deviation will be detectable as a stutter by users, and anything within that range is acceptable. With the Titan RTX cards in NVLink, we immediately see a dense frame time bar that ticks back and forth in an oscillating pattern. This isn't an ideal bar. Every other frame is half the speed of the previous delivery, which may speak to alternate frame rendering patterns. We're seeing frames at 3.2 milliseconds, then 6.3 milliseconds, then 3.2, then 6.2, and so on. Fortunately, this pattern isn't highly noticeable to the user, as it's really just 3 milliseconds, but it's certainly less smooth than a single Titan RTX. A single Titan RTX has frame time variation of less than 1 millisecond per frame, which is incredibly good. It's industry leading. You can't get much smoother delivery than that. The single 2080 Ti looks similar, with variation frame to frame of less than 1 millisecond on average. SLI produces a similarly chaotic pattern for the 1080 Ti's, although a less chaotic one for the SLI 2080 Ti's than the Titans. 
It's still less consistent than a single card, but ends up somewhere between the dual titans and a single 2080 Ti for consistency. The chart is getting a bit illegible at this point, so we'll cap it here. Wherever you see the thicker lines, that's an SLI configuration. Anywhere you see the thinner lines is a single device. F1 2018 gives us the opposite perspective, instead looking at a well-built DirectX 11 title. This represents most of the games on the market presently, and in this title, the SLI Titan RTX cards operate at 175 FPS average, with frame time scaling minimally from a single card. The single Titan RTX does 110 FPS average, with lows at 51 and 29, as opposed to 67 and 28 for the SLI configuration, demonstrating limited gains in the frame time department. In SLI, the Titan RTX cards hold a lead of 3.8% over the dual 2080 Ti cards, which is overall unimpressive. Scaling versus the single Titan RTX is 59%. That's better than a lot of games when running SLI, but nothing close to what we saw with Sniper. As for CPU limitations, we know from our 1080p test that this game can minimally push 213 FPS average, so we aren't hitting a limitation there just yet. Far Cry 5 at 4K places the Titan RTX NVLink cards at 114 FPS average, scaling about 5.3% ahead of the NVLink RTX 2080 Ti cards, or about 25% over the dual 1080 Ti cards. As for scaling over a single device, the dual Titan RTXs end up 63% ahead of a single Titan RTX, with dual 2080 Ti scaled about 65% over a single 2080 Ti, and dual 1080 Ti scaled about 59% over a single 1080 Ti. 1440p testing shows us that we weren't hitting a CPU limit in the previous chart, although it's starting to emerge here. NVLink Titans do 143 FPS average, but scaling is now limited to 12% over a single Titan RTX. It's at this point that we're clearly hitting CPU bottlenecks. We won't bother showing it, but at 1080p the limit was also 143 FPS average, so that does confirm a cap for the CPU. GTA 5 deserves a bit of a a prelude before we get into the numbers. If you missed it previously, we discovered an issue with GTA 5 where i5 CPUs would bounce off of the frame rate cap at 187.5 FPS average. It did so in a pretty rough way. This resulted in higher performing i5 CPUs getting punished for their high performance because they'd stutter hard with each hit to 187.5 FPS. But if you pushed the frame rate down intentionally, making the graphics, for example, higher quality, that would result in a better gameplay experience, despite having technically lower FPS in the average. This was never resolved by Rockstar, and the best solution was to just increase the graphics quality until frame rate became worse on average. A higher frame rate gave a worse experience. That's seen again here, despite using an i7-8086K at 5.1 gigahertz or so. We never saw this in our previous testing, so it's somewhat unique. At 4K, our SLI Titan RTX cards are hitting 151 FPS average, which would look fine if we only looked at averages. In reality, the frame times are inconsistent, with 1% lows hitting 39, and 0.1% lows hitting 13.5. So somewhere in there we're hitting stutters. It's instances like this, where our 1% and 0.1% low numbers work to illustrate well the limitations of the average frame rate, but we still need a bit more. We'll look at frame times in a second. The SLI 2080 Ti cards didn't encounter the same issue, as frame rate was low enough to not trip GTA 5's weird game engine constraints that we've found in the past. Here's the example of why average frame rate is insufficient for a lot of things. In this scenario, the chart looks great for the Titan RTX card for most of the test, that is, until we hit about the 3,000th frame where we encounter 180 millisecond render time. This means that you're waiting for nearly a fifth of a second to get a new frame, which is very noticeable. This happens again toward the end, then again in rapid succession, where we encounter multiple 240 millisecond frame times in a row. Performance is dismal in this title despite overall high averages. Oddly, the 2080 Ti's and SLI don't seem to get hit as hard. The solution is to boost graphic settings until FPS is lower on average, which will help dodge these issues. It seems like this is probably a GTA engine bug and is related to the previous bug that we discovered with the i5 CPUs. Finally, here's a look at power consumption during our GTA 5 test passes. The first set of tests shows 1080p results plotting 480 watts for total system power with the SLI Titans, or about 330 watts total system power for the single Titan RTX card. That increases to 560 watts at 1440p, as we were heavily CPU limited in, at the 1080p test, and the single card climbs to 400 watts under the same scenario. At 4K, the total system power consumption for SLI 
and the Titan RTX cards is 720 watts, with the single Titan RTX card still capped at about 400 watts. That's it for this one. It's just a, it's just a what if scenario. Uh, we don't suspect many people are going to be buying these for gaming and putting them in SLI, which is what NVLink is, because in this use case, NVLink is, I mean, it works like SLI. It does AFR, it doesn't pool the resources, so it's SLI. But people are still gonna buy these just to have the best, just like they bought the Titan XP for the best, where you're paying about $200 per one extra frame over the 1080 Ti at the time of launch. So they're still going to be buying these and probably still going to be buying them for SLI. If you happen to be one of those people who is considering that purchase, we would strongly advise that you consider dual 2080 Ti's instead, if even that. But if you must have two video cards for gaming, you're talking like 3% improvement by spending two times the amount of money. So 2080 Ti's, even in, in dual configurations, which we don't fully recommend, would be a better purchase. And if, even if you have a lot of money, you can still do other things with that money in the computer. So that's, that's all we'd suggest that you consider. One upside of these though, if you are buying them, is that it's a 2080 Ti FE PCB. So if you wanted to put a water cooler on this, it's trivial. You buy a 2080 Ti uh, water block from EK or uh, Alpha Cool or Thermal Take or any of them, and uh, trivially remove about 30 screws and then you're good to go. But that's it for this one. We don't recommend the purchase. If you wanted the numbers though, you now have them. So thank you for watching. As always, go to store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly by buying a shirt like this one or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.